you uh, very much. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Thanks to Susan Elliott, the director of ACOS. Um, thank, and congratulations to any of you for being newly appointed or old members as well. So um, well done to all of you. Um, I too um, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. And it uh, does give me great pleasure to be speaking to you about some of the work that I've done as Australia's first Children's Commissioner. I was privileged to be the first one back in 2013, my appointment was. Um, and I think we're supposed to do something. That way. Okay. Um, but more specifically, as Susan said, today I want to um, talk about the work I've been leading nationally on the development of national principles for child safe organisations. And I think this project um, speaks pretty directly to the themes of this conference, raised expectations, raised responsibilities. Because one of the key um, objectives of the national uh, principles project is to convey to organisations and those working in them that it's, it is essential for them to step up so that they attend to promote um, and implement children's rights in practice. So, but before I go on to that, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about um, my role um, as Children's Commissioner. So, um, in that role, I, I am asked to, under law, to um, promote discussion and awareness of children's rights, promote children's participation in decisions that concern them, and assess whether the laws, bills and policies protect children's rights, uh, encouraging good practice, and as Susan said, I've submitted an annual report to Parliament which has explored particular issues in relation to children's rights. Um, my work is, focused, is, is underpinned and guided by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, this is the most ratified of all conventions uh, internationally in the world. And I think that says something about, at least in theory, about how much we value uh, children. And it makes clear that children have the same rights as adults, but they are also uh, entitled to special rights and protections because of their unique vulnerabilities and attributes of children. And by ratifying the convention back in 1990, Australia promised to protect and uphold the rights of all children in our country. Um, the convention covers a broad spectrum of children's rights and all of these are interrelated. You can't just pick one up and say that's important but the other one isn't. They all work together to help <coughs> children thrive. One of them it relates to children's right to safety. They also have a right to be protected from violence, abuse and neglect. It's, it's, it, it, the convention is underpinned by four guiding principles. The right to survival and development, non-discrimination, the best interests of the child as a primary consideration, and children's right to, uh, to be heard, to participate in decisions that affect them. Through my work, I consult with governments as well as with a wide range of non-government organisations, academics, researchers and other experts. But most importantly, I spend as much time as I can speaking with children and young people about what matters to them. And two key things that kids say to me uh, when we talk about their safety and well-being in organisations is that they want to be able to have a say and they expect adults to take action when they know something is not right. And I think these are the themes that also resonated um, through much of the work undertaken by the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, um, which wound up a year ago now, just about. Unfortunately, many children who tried to speak up about their experiences were not listened to, and we know that many adults failed to act appropriately when they knew about abuse. Um, I was closely involved in the work of the Commission, um, particularly those aspects that focused on the prevention of institutional abuse into the future. And in addition to um, inquiry into um, uh, child sexual abuse in institutions, the Royal Commission's terms of reference 
also asks that they consider what institutions and governments could do to better protect children against child sexual abuse and re related matters in institutional contexts in the future. The Royal Commission drew from research, consultations, submissions and case studies to develop a framework containing 10 elements or standards designed to make institutions what they call child safe. And these are called child safe standards and are included in volume six of the final report, which has 17 volumes. So um, it could be a nice stocking filler for Christmas um, <laughs> if this is sold out. Um, the Royal Commission recommended that these child safe standards apply to, institution, to all institutions that engage in child related work and also recommended um, the establishment of a new Office of Child Safety in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and that this should be trans, uh, transitioned into a, in a uh, government, a statutory authority within 18 months. Um, the work of the National Office uh, would includes the le uh, leading the coordination of these child safe standards. The development, it also recommended the development of a new national framework for child safety, including a national strategy to prevent child se sexual abuse. Uh, it's also working on a prevalence study, a maltreatment prevalence study, this would be the first ever in the Australian context we would ever have. Um, the, and it also recommended that the national standards developed by the Royal Commission should be adopted as part of this a new national statement of principles for child safe organisations. So the Royal Commission was aware of the work we'd already started and they were crafting some recommendations to make sure this had legs into the future. Noting we needed a national approach to this stuff. Um, as well as obviously um, work going on in the states and territories to reflect their particular needs. But there are many organisations in Australia um, who have footprints in many states and territories and they really needed one sort of source of information about what this meant uh, to those organisations. The Royal Commission did acknowledge that child safe, safe frameworks must have a broader application than the prevention of just sexual abuse alone. These frameworks should guide organisations in how to prevent, identify and improve responses to all forms of abuse and neglect. Child safe frameworks should also help organisations to ensure children's well-being more broadly. And well-being is more than just being safe from harm. It's a focus on children's rights, their well-being as the fundamental platform for keeping them safe. And this kind of approach also recognises the strengths of organisations that deliver services to children and the benefits, the great benefits that children themselves gain from being part of organisations of various kinds. For example, organisations can help to foster uh, wellbeing in children by helping them develop positive relationships with peers and adults, uh, to learn about the world around them, explore things they're interested in, uh, feel empowered by enabling them to have a voice. <coughs> so as part of the development of these principles, and it's a very dead slide, I'm sorry about that, I've been uh, consulting through two advisory groups established um, last year. One consisting of representatives across sectors working with or volunteering with children. And this has, as you can see from the list, sports, recreation, early childhood, education, religious services, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services, local government services, health, arts, recreation, disability, anybody we could think of, in fact, who was working with children. Um, the other, and it also included some of the high profile case studies in the Royal Commission, so it has the YMCA and Scouts on it as well, who are actually quite long far along in their journey now in, in, in turning the culture of their organisations around. The other comprise national advocacy organisations like Children and Young People with Disability, Headspace, Parent and Research Centre, Multicultural Youth Advocacy Network, Our Watch, LGBTI Health. And the idea was to shine a, um, a lens 
from the perspective of children with particular needs, which may require organisations to take particular types of actions in response. Uh, I also consulted with children and young people, um, asked them to tell me what makes them feel safe and included in organisational setting, settings. They particularly, they emphasised um, the importance of being treated with dignity and respect, um, to be welcome and have a sense of belonging, because safety is a very broad concept for them, and how organisations should be more genuine, responsible and responsive and how unfairness should be addressed. If you've got children, you know how unfairness is, they're very keen on unfairness, they can snip it out. Uh, children also told me uh, that they want organisations to promise them some of these things. They want everyone to be treated fairly and equally, that places should be made happy and comfortable. They want the adults to be good at what they do. Now, this was especially directed at teachers they want, they want access to technology, which is now seen as a, as a sort of in the rights domain for kids, and care, meaning health care, when they needed it. Um, they want uh, adults to understand the needs of individual children. They want to make sure there are lots of different ways for children to have a say because they all aren't articulate in, or competent in the same way. And they want you to not just listen, but to act. The national principles, um, we hope, will drive implementation of a child safe culture across all these sectors providing services to children. And they're relevant to organisations of all different sizes and across all sectors. They apply to all organisations with a duty of care to children and young people, from your volunteer playgroup and local sporting clubs to recreation, education and faith-based services. Embedding these kinds of ch child safe cultures requires visionary leadership in the active promotion of, ch of the rights of children. And it, importantly, it's also about the small things in terms of a staff member or volunteer's daily interaction with a child. So, do the staff in your organisation know what rights a child has? Does a child know their own rights? Can the child have routine opportunities to have their voices heard? How welcome and included uh, do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families feel in that organisation? Or, for that matter, children from linguistically and culturally diverse <coughs> backgrounds? What steps is your organisation taking to support parents and carers to feel comfortable and informed about children's safety and wellbeing in those spaces? Similarly, are parents and carers aware of complaints processes in the organisation? And does the organisation regularly seek feedback from parents and carers and children to ensure there are opportunities for the particip their participation in the organisation's directions or activities? So what do these principles say? As I've noted, there are 10 principles which should collectively show that a child safe organisation consciously and systematically creates an environment where children's safety and well-being is at the centre of thought, values and actions, places emphasis on genuine engagement and valuing of children, creates conditions that reduce the likelihood of harm to children and young people, and also conditions that increase the likelihood of identifying any harm that does occur, and responds effectively to any concerns, disclosures, allegations or suspicions of harm. This is the wheel of safety, sometimes called the flower of safety, but it's a wheel today. And so as you can see, starting from the top and moving right, the first four principles emphasise getting the organisational culture right, um, including committed leadership and appropriate governance. Um, it's also about children learning about their rights and being empowered to speak out addressing children's diverse needs and involving families. The principles five, six and seven are about the organisation's processes for recruiting, training and supporting staff and dealing with concerns, complaints and incidents. And included in that is making sure you're doing your background screening um, and uh, all that mandatory reporting training if you're a mandatory reporter as well. 
So that's a dense and quite technical <coughs> principle. Um, that's principle five. Uh, principle eight focuses on managing the risks to children in physical and online environments. Now, we're pretty okay with the physical environment and stuff. We know about line of sight to kids and the way we design buildings and spaces and keeping you know, a rubbish away and, and glass, you know, cleaned up and all of that. But I think we're much less kind of confident in this online space. And I think that's a sort of a brave new world for all of us to think about how do our staff communicate or volunteers communicate with children? What are the protocols around that and the limitations on that? What, what do you do if a child brings a, a, a harmful image in on their phone to the service? All of these things we've got to now think about um, in ways we might have had to before. But really, really important because a lot of harm can occur through those, um, through those platforms. And the final two principles are around the need for current accessible child safe policies and procedures and the need for these to be regularly re re reviewed and improved. I'm just going to have a little focus now on principle two. Um, this states that children and young people are informed about their rights, participate in decisions affecting them, and are taken seriously. This requires children, uh, uh, sorry, organisations to inform children and young people about their rights, including to safety, information, and participation. <coughs> and this needs to be done through child friendly culturally and age-appropriate strategies to communicate, for, to help them communicate their views and participate in these decisions and raise concerns. And organisations will need to have programs and resources to educate children and young people about their rights and be proactive in regularly seeking children's views and encouraging that participation in decision making. Children and young people also need to know and understand their responsibilities in ensuring their own safety and that of their peers. This principle is, of course, inspired by children's right to be heard, which is one, which is Article 12, um, in, and is one of the four general uh, guiding principles of the Convention. So, then, what does this article say? It says that children and young people are given the opportunity to participate in decisions that affect them and that governments should take, and others should take into account the views of children in the laws and policies that impact on them. And this is a gateway um, to all other rights in the Convention. And when it's realised, it simultaneously <coughs> empowers and safeguards children. The Royal Commission noted the importance of promoting the participation and empowerment of children and young people in an organisation, and how this is a protective <coughs> factor that contributes to their safety and well-being. And the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is the expert group that advises on um, our implementation of the Convention, has emphasised that Article 12 applies to both younger and older children. So even the very youngest children are entitled to express their views, and that these should be given due weight in accordance with their age and maturity as active members of families, communities and societies. And to exercise these rights, young children have particular requirements in terms of physical nurturance, emotional care, and sensitive guidance. And they also need to be given appropriate time for social play, they need space for that, and they need opportunities to explore and learn. One of the profound learnings from the Royal Commission, I think, is that silencing children, not providing them an avenue to be heard or believed, does not protect them. In fact, it does the opposite. So silent children are never protected children. Um, at the moment, um, uh, the Human Rights Commission, uh, in my little area of children's rights, is busily developing practical tools and resources to help organisations implement these national principles. Um, these include um, a new website, that's ready to go, um, online training modules that will help take people through the national principles interactively, a self-assessment tool which will help organisations consider their, their current child safe practices and areas for improvement, so that's a sort of a starting point for organisations, a template uh, that organisations can use to develop a charter of commitment to children and young people, and ideally this would be developed in consultation with the 
children and young people in the organisation themselves. There's our sample uh, code of conduct that organisations can adapt um, that sets out expected standards of behaviour when you're engaging with children and young people. A template that organisations can use to develop a child safety and wellbeing policy. Uh, an online safety checklist for organisations that we've done in conjunction with the eSafety Commissioner. And we also uh, have a guide for parents and carers about what they should be looking for when they turn up first time for a service, for instance. So, and we've got many more in the wings. And they're based on what people have told us they need and want. So we're not wanting to reinvent the wheel, wheel where there are um, resources already out there. It's where there are gaps. And the other thing is that these are very simple. We're trying to keep it simple, stupid, because we don't want to scare organisations off. We want them to go pick this information up and go, yeah, we can do that. We can actually review our own practices and procedures and it's not too onerous on them. Um, so where are we now? Um, we're actually now waiting uh, for endorsement by the National um, Council, uh, the Council of Australian Governments. Because of the shenanigans that has gone on down here recently, we've been delayed a little. Uh, so because we didn't know who COAG was for a while. But um, so it was supposed to be June and it slipped down. So we're hoping that by December this year we can go live with all this stuff that I just mentioned and that we can really um, help organisations go on this journey who haven't started or are in the middle of their journey, in fact. You know, um, I just I did want to emphasise that we know that organisations are in different spaces and 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 and, uh, sit, uh, and situations in terms of their child safe journey, um, and there are many that are well progressed and will have a continuing need for monitoring, review, and improvement. Um, but others are really very early on in their. But, and, and this slide just sort of talks about how it needs to be a whole of organisation journey that um, organisations do go on, from top down to bottom up. Um, and that to get this lasting change. And, and this cycle represents the different steps of the journey um, and the fact that it should be continuous, you know. Because people change in organisations, you need these cultures to be embedded and, and, and part of the furniture. And obviously, the other thing I wanted to emphasise about this journey is the conversation needs to directly involve children and young people, not just staff and adults, uh, using cultural and age-appropriate strategies to seek and listen to the views of children and young people and to allow them to take part in the process. Lastly, I just wanted to um, say something about um, the, uh, our report to the United Nations uh, uh, committee on the Rights of the Child, which we've just submitted. Um, so every five years or so, each country needs to front up where it has uh, uh, treaty obligations and say how it's going. Australia has reported earlier this year on how it was going against the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I just recently, on the 1st of November, put in a, a report from the National Human Rights Institution as Children's Commissioner on that same subject. And what, what, there's a process now at which Australia will be, appear before that committee in the uh, late next year. Uh, so um, I just wanted to let you know that that process is going on. And that last time the committee met, they, in, in their report that followed their um, meeting with the Australian government, they raised a number of issues. In particular, they were concerned about um, the overrepresentation of Indigenous children. Um, in various um, systems, in particular the out-of-home care system, but they were also worried about the number of the number of kids in care generally in the Australian context. I think this is something we we struggle with still, and we still haven't got that early intervention piece right um, that would stem the flow of kids into those systems. They were also very concerned about the uh, number of children in Australia who are ex exposed to family and domestic violence. And while there's a lot of work going on in that space. I don't know whether we're making inroads uh, in getting a downward trend in that area at this, at this space. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that and note that during that process we, we held roundtables including in the ACT uh, across Australia. We uh, 
asked for submissions. We've got 127, I think, submissions uh, from various stakeholders and experts. Um, we uh, had a lot of individual in interviews with individual people, and we talked to lots of children. And one of the ways we talked to lots of children was by partnering up with ABC Behind the News. We had a kids' rights a poll about what rights are most important to them, um, what's good things about Australia and where Australia might do better. Um, and we got in response to that poll to about 450 kids face to face. So I've got all their words in my head as well. But just in terms of what their top rights were, they were they wanted to be safe was their main right that they wanted to what they uh, valued. Their top right. They want the second one was um, uh, to be cared for and have a home, and the third top right was um, uh, to access have access to clean water and clean air. Um, and so that's what kids say are the most important things to them. Um, I must say those rights were less true for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids and kids from culturally and linguistically uh, diverse communities backgrounds and and the things that they felt were le least true for them were um, uh, in terms of getting access to accurate information uh, being treated fairly and having a say so we've got a lot of work to do in those areas and again those two cohorts of kids um, that was least true for them as well uh, in particular so we've got a lot of work to do to make our kids feel part of our citizenry um, even though they are. Just some of the recommendations. There's 60 recommendations in the report to the UN, and there's a, I think there's a few copies of some of the recommendations out there. Um, one, of, one recommendation is that we develop a national plan for child wellbeing um, using the Child Rights Convention as a sort of foundation document to, to guide how that is. And things that, you know, that we can do some targeted interventions and, and work in that space on things like poverty and homelessness, uh, mental health, some of the key issues facing our kids. Um, uh, we, we, we recommended that the Australian government introduce a child, child rights and wellbeing impact assessments on all legislative and policy changes that affect children's rights. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, that the, and the Australian government's established a standing ministerial council to oversee that plan that I talked about. There are a number of other recommendations that we introduce a National Human Rights Act and a National Human Rights Action uh, Agenda, including education about children's rights for children and for adults. And another important recommendation that's in there that I think probably this time has come is to age, raise the age of criminal responsibility uh, from 10 to somewhere else. Um, so those are just some of the snapshots of some of the things that are in there um, and that have gone to the committee. Um, so I'm sure that when the committee, when Australia faces the committee in October next year, it will need to respond to some of these things. And so that's the whole point of the whole process. Um, just to um, conclude, I think it's really interesting that kids rated safety as um, their number one right. Um, the attention that the Royal Commission has brought to the issue of child safety means that many organisations that work with children are on their, likely on their way to making a start and talking about child safety and wellbeing. But what I really want to emphasise to you today is that talking about child safety and wellbeing means raising the expectations we have of ourselves in understanding, promoting and helping children to realise their rights and taking these responsibilities seriously. When the national principles are finalised, I hope they'll be a pivotal tool that will support all types of organisations, both large and small across Australia, to better respect children's rights and provide caring, respectful, respectful and safe environments for every child and young person who comes through their doors. But the principles um, are more than just about what organisations uh, can and should do. Ultimately, they are about the cultures and attitudes that need to permeate right through our communities so that all children can thrive. Thank you. We do have a little sub-site at the Hear Arts Commission, so we've got a newsletter so you can subscribe in the meantime.
time as we wait for co-ed to go through its slow world uh, process. Um, there is help you can get in the meantime, so I would encourage you to just sign up to uh, our website and uh, access whatever resources we can give you at the moment. Thank you. Megan, that was great, and um, certainly there's work being done in the ACT around um, child safety organisations, and it's really lovely to be able to hear, you know, what's happening from the United Nations down, and, and to think about how our um, responsibilities fit into that and can contribute to creating environments for children to child. So that's great. I just want to check if there's anybody in the audience who might have some questions. Um, we've got a bit of time for questions. Yes, so over. Yeah. Hi, Megan. Will Mollis from the ACT. Thank you very much for that. You were talking about uh, changing cultures. Got me wondering what you think are the most immediate challenges that you'll be facing. Um, I think one of the things is people think you can do a working with children check and you can set and forget. I think that's a real problem. Um, um, being someone who's actually run a work in the children check system, they really only keep, you know, the worst of the worst out of the system. And they certainly don't capture people who haven't been caught <coughs> or haven't offended yet. Um, and also people think about this harm business as only about pedophiles or children. And it's actually much more than that. Kids can be traumatised in all sorts of ways from all sorts of harms and we really need to look holistically at what that means. So I think that's one of the big challenges, getting people away from the working with children check, check box. Because um, uh, we spend a lot of effort on and money on that thing without it really being about. And, and seeing, you know, you see some of the um, cases in the Royal Commission with the Jonathan Lord case. He came from overseas. They couldn't get any records anyway from overseas because our system doesn't allow that. Um, and nobody even did a referees check. They just used the material he provided. So that's just because you have a check doesn't mean you're suitable to work with children. And so that's a big, I think, one of the big challenges. Um, the other thing is some some organisations struggle to know how to relate to children and to talk to children, even though they're a children's organisation, which I find really interesting. So I think there's a job to be done in helping them to overcome that fear of talking to children because they think they're going to harm them in some way, but in fact. They end up harming them more by not providing those platforms where they can speak up and, 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 and um, be respected in their contribution. So I think that's another big challenge that I've noticed. Yeah. And the other thing is, it's it's got to go through the whole organisation. A, a worker needs, or a volunteer, needs to feel that whoever's at the top of the organisation will have their back if they speak out about something and they call out something. So it's that holistic kind of faith in that they can actually stand up and speak out. And I think that was one of the big things the Royal Commission found, that people were afraid to speak up and call out another colleague because those messages hadn't come down strongly enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Megan. Um, Chris Reddick from White Community Service District. I was interested in the feedback you received from your consultations regarding the work of community organisations specifically. Um, from community organisations or from children? From, yeah, from children about community experience in okay. community organisations. Um, yeah. um, a lot of the kids in those um, organisations um, you know, had, had a rough time. Uh, so they were very keen to ensure that they were the ones who said, you've got to know the individual ch child, because uh, they're not all the same, they come from different backgrounds. Um, they also emphasised things like accessibility as well. Um, some of them had disabilities of various kinds, so they were really wanted to make sure that organisations thought about how easy it was to access information and physical environments and everything else. <laughs> um, they also were very keen that they were part of any codes of conduct that got developed. They, because they were disempowered kids who were finding their empowerment, were very keen 
to take hold of that sort of stuff. So <coughs> those were the kinds of things that I think they said, yeah. And it's often hard. I mean, I feel sometimes um, that I come into these spaces, these kids don't know me at all, and I'm asking them to tell me their inner thoughts. And so I just generally pretty upfront when I come in and say, I know you don't know me from a bar or so. They all look at me because they've never heard that say it before. It's an old person saying. Um, <laughs> but, I, um, but I tell them that what it's for and they're, they're generally pretty okay after that. And they can see the value that they're going to bring into it. And also, of course, feeding back what we've learned to them is absolutely critical uh, in terms of ensuring they'll continue to be engaged in a space like that and, and be generous with me and other people. So I just think with those vulnerable kids, you've got to be pretty honest with them because they can feel a fake like immediately. Yeah. It's really good. Can I just, sorry. <coughs> I've only been here two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Thomas from Manual Literature. <laughs> and um, of the 23,000 kids that responded, how many of them kids were actual Torres Strait Islander? 6%, which is about the population of Aboriginal youth in Australia. So we were really pleased with that. So they're all watching the ABC, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, I haven't broken it. We've still got some data to break down in terms of rural and um, remote locations and stuff, so to see if there's any differences. We, there was also a free text box, so we're really interested to see what they said in that. Um, we do intend to, the report we've done for the UN is a very UN-y kind of report. So um, it's, it, there's a certain way you need to report and it's got to be in a certain format and a certain data that they need. But we've got much more material than that, including lots of kids' voices uh, and including lots of Indigenous kids' voices actually as well. Uh, and so what we're going to do with that material is develop it into a, an Australia-facing report that is basically state of the connection of <coughs> children's rights in Australia and really provide much more colour and movement than the dry old report from the UN. That will be hopefully a benchmark for years to come and people can repeat that kind of exercise um, in line with our treaty obligations and we'll see if we've moved in a positive direction. So, so hopefully that would be a nice thing to be able to come back and give to you some other time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Meg. I'm just interested in what young people and children were saying to you about children and young people harming other children and young people. Um, it's a big issue it's an issue in schools um, and other places and I guess I'm interested in what were some of the themes and I know the World Commission's did a really good report on that but I'd be interested to know whether you've got some ideas around in becoming a child safe or a better child safe organisation, what are some of the things that we might perhaps do better in relation to that? Um, yeah, it's a really good question and it's something that at least in terms of sexual abuse um, the Royal Commission recommended that the National Office of Child Safety um, do work in that area and have that national um, um, uh, response to sexual abuse. One of them is on peer-on-peer -peer abuse. Um, and it's focused on sexual abuse, but I think we need to go broader than that because these things happen in other contexts. Um, and it is an issue that kids do bring up, mostly that they feel unsafe in places and they don't know why they've been put together with other kids that make them feel unsafe. Um, and we know why, because the system makes us. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and so the system has to be thinking, not only do we, as in, we have to think about individual children and their needs and their safety, but the systems need to think of that, and be re reimagined in a way, so that we can actually respond to the individual needs of kids who may be unsafe in those environments. I also think we need to, I think it's not always clear who the perpetrator and the victim is, and I don't think we know that much about that. It's like bullies and people we believe, and I really think there's a lot more research that needs to be done, and I don't mean to obfuscate, but I really do think we need to know a lot more about those spaces and the dynamics of what's happening, and going back to the kids and asking them about that. I didn't ask them about that directly. If, they only offered it if it was something that was top of mind for them. 
Um, but their physical state is very important to them, you know. Um, uh, and, and the risks that other kids pose to them is on their minds if they're in these kinds of settings in particular, I don't see, especially residentials, you know, because they know they're, they're stuck with a group of people they didn't choose. Uh, they don't have a lot of choices as kids in these systems don't. So I, I'm not offering you uh, any answer, I know, uh, but I do think it's something we really got to focus on. And even down to, I've actually started talking <coughs> to some people in the early childhood sector to do some work on this issue in early childhood settings because there's a bit of moral panic going on as well, you know, when any kid displays any sexuality or is a bit rough with another kid, and I think we've got to work out what's developmentally normal uh, and, but identify when things might be escalating and help and guide the practitioners and educators in that, those spaces to deal with those things, especially concerns raised by parents. Yeah. I'm really loud anyway, so it's yes, fine. Yes, yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> Camilla Rowland from Mary Mead. Megan, um, I'm really interested in what the interface with the broader community and commercial world might be around this and I'll give you a very specific example. We're at the moment building some care accommodation cottages and up the hill from us is another development and that is owned by a very large international commercial company, developing company. And they've come to us and said, our residents are going to be looking down on your care cottages. What do we need to do? What are the standards around the safety of those children? What do we need to be compliant with? And in my searches for the ACT, I cannot find anything around, so there's disability access, that's not what they're asking about. They're asking about <coughs> what's required in order to maintain the safety of the children from their residents viewing down on top of these care cottages. Do you see any um, type of broader standards or regulations coming out for the commercial world? Uh, these, these principles apply as much to the commercial <coughs> world as anybody else. So that's certainly in the Human Rights Commission. We've got a, a business and human rights um, partnership that we're trying to uh, prosecute these standards through that space. Um, I think it's going to be a slower realisation, but good on these people, you know, for thinking about it. Um, and of course there's all sorts of, not only in terms of the residents having access to the kids, but also privacy and all of that sort of stuff. So I think there is an absolute role uh, for people who, uh, to educate and help those organisations to put in place um, safeguards for the kids in their communities and this is the thing about business business and human rights movement which is actually is is a thing um, is that it's not just about supply chains of child workers it's also about the communities in which they live engage and children as consumers all sorts of areas where um, business has a safeguarding role for children so it's, it's an area where that it's new, but I think it's, it's absolutely one you've identified correctly. We got a call the other day from the National Caravan and something, Caravanning and you know, Holiday Park um, Association, right? Asking about their, where they've got playgrounds and stuff for kids or kids clubs and stuff like that in their commercial venture. What, what can we, how can we help them to think about that? So people are starting to think about um, their duty of care to children in their community itself, and whether it be commercial interest or not. So it's all there to be done. And that's the, that's the outreach that really needs to be done. Sometimes I'm talking to the converter, but more and more I want to be talking to the, the fresh new ones that haven't even thought about this. And, yeah. <coughs> and, and also the other thing is a lot of things that used to be you know, um, government or NGO are now commercialised, like sport, you know? You're all paying a lot of money in fees for your kids and grandkids and stuff to attend these things. What do we know about how safe kids are in those environments? So. Hi there, um, over here in the corner, um, I'm Rachel for People with Disabilities ACT. Um, I just wanted to find out your views on the intersection with um, raising the um, criminal age and I guess the gap in how to provide for that age group. Uh, in July in the ACT there was some Canberra Times articles about an 11 year old 
girl that was detained in uh, the youth detention centre several times. She's only 11, and our ACT criminal law states that she should either return home or go to the detention centre or go to a therapeutic um, facility, but there is no facility. So I'm interested in what you think about all of that. Yeah, well, um, certainly um, you need to make sure there are programs or supports or facilities in place. Um, my experience is that many those younger cohorts are really in there for petty crimes on the whole, on the whole. And it's rare to have somebody that's in there for something more than that. And they shouldn't be in there in the first place. I mean, we should have, I mean, surely that's the best we can do is lock up a 10 year old, I doubt it. Um, and so, um, but I think in the case you're talking about, there's more complex needs at play. And I, but in a small jurisdiction like this, you should be able to wrap something around this young human being. Um, and and I, I, we need to just prioritise that. Being in detention won't be good for her. Um, it's not good for kids. They, um, they um, uh, establish criminal identities really early and they establish criminal associations. And the likelihood of her going back and back again is very, um, is very high. And that's a very expensive proposition because it costs about $500,000 to keep one kid in a detention facility for a year. Surely we could do better with that money in terms of your therapeutic approach <laughs> uh, to uh, a young person in that situation. Many other countries manage this and we should be looking to them as well. So New Zealand is 14. Uh, they managed to um, deal with kids who were demonstrating various behaviours early on and, and, and divert them from the criminal justice system, which is the outcome we want. Uh, in China at 16, my God, who, who would have thought? Um, uh, so in Portugal I think it's 16, I mean, so, you know, and these aren't rampant places with rampant crime everywhere. They've managed to develop systems that respond to the young people's needs and divert them from those systems. We, we get a whole heap of Aboriginal kids out of the system as well, because they make up the bulk of the younger cohort as well. So for all sorts of reasons, we need to be really seriously thinking um, economic, social justice, just in terms of children getting their rights, um, we need to be thinking of alternatives to locking up kids so young. So I'm a bit passionate about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. I think that's the end of the questions. Um, I just wanted to say there's a few things that came through as really key messages for <coughs> us as at cost, but I think also us as a whole community of practice. I quite liked hearing that um, many children were interested in being safe, having access to care and housing and clean air and water, because that lines up with most of our advocacy agenda, so I'm glad we're on track. Um, and also <coughs> that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and children from culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds were looking for accurate information to be treated fairly and to have a say, because I think that's been some really core messaging from organisations and advocates in Canberra and it's good to hear that's on track with what those children and young people think is missing in, in the systems. And of course, poverty, homelessness and mental health, what more do we need to say to get those up the agenda in terms of investment? So thank you for affirming all of those for us and for giving us a further evidence base on which we can build um, better practice in organisations.